Welcome to the post tea session. Our first speaker is Boalem Quida. He is giving a talk on stochastic and deterministic models for tropical growth. Boalem. Uh, thanks a lot. I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation to, to come to this wonderful place. This is my first time in India, so I, I'm enjoying it very well. I've eaten lots of spices, and uh, it's, it's, it's very, very good. So, um, so my talk is going to be on stochastic and deterministic model for tropical convection. This is joint work with Andy Maida and Evgeny Frankel and lots of other collaborators who you see their names uh, as I go. Um, so this is uh, my research is funded by the Canadian government. This is why you see this maple leaf here. Um, this is the uh, outline of my talk, which is a short introduction of what we are doing on, on how and why. So I give you the, an introduction to the deterministic multi-cloud model for organized convection, which we were working on uh, with Andy uh, for a while now. And then I will uh, talk about the stochastic version of it. And then I will talk about the new effect that we recently introduced the stochastic model. That's uh, the effect of congestive detrainment. I will explain what that is. And then I will show you some new simulations with the stochastic model uh, on uh, column model and on uh, XT simulations for flows uh, above the equator. So the main question is um, I'm going to try to answer is why do we need stochastic models for convection? I guess it's probably obvious the answer for most people, but I just want to refresh things. So, First of all, we have the parameterizations that today, today's climate models use are this quasi-equilibrium uh, assumption that basically completely inures interactions of clouds with themselves. Uh, that's what you would call the unresolved uh, uh, variability due to unresolved processes. So these interactions with the clouds themselves and with the environment is completely in your. So the parameterization just thinks about something that's in static equilibrium all the time. That's not really the truth at all. So the, the, the variability of the, of, the, of the convection is tied to the variability of the large scales. That's not the true story. So we try to make a, a, an adequate representation of this subgrid dynamics based on this statistical self-similarity that's been observed in tropical uh, convection. So observation specialists were telling us that there is self-similarity in clouds, in, in cloud organization on at least three various scales. On nasal scales, on synaptic scales, on a planetary scale, on MJO and uh, convectively coupled waves and, and, and nasal scale systems like square lines. They all share some kind of uh, the, uh, this uh, self-similar structure in, in convection and I'm going to show you what this structure looks like. So, so basically, uh, what I'm saying is that we are trying to capture deviations from this quasi-equilibrium paradigm. And that we hope we are going to improve this variability due to this unresolved processes in climate models, and by that reduce, uh, reduce the model error in these models. So our, our, our basic idea is to propose a stochastic model that captures the dynamics of cloud area fractions. So you can take that model and put it in your parameterization of choice, and you can get a better representation of the unresolved processes in your uh, climate model. So the basic picture is this one. So you have your GCM model. You have your parameterization. You can hook up our stochastic multi-cloud model and to your cumulus parameterization, and you have the stochastic parameterization, of course, use information for the large scales, and then it will feed back into the cumulus parameterization, and then here you get the missing variability in your GCM. So this is the three main cloud types that have been observed in the tropics to be basically uh, the basis of the dynamics or, of all these features that we see uh, what we call organized tropical convection, on large scales, on synaptic scales, and mesoscales scales, and planetary scales. So we always people see congested clouds in front of the wave, then uh, the lag, the, the, the deep convection follows 
in, in, in basically in the center of convection is dominated by, by deep convection and then there are trailing stratiform anvils behind deep convection. Pardon me? The what? The, the army. Oh, I'm not talking about the army. The army is behind. I'm going to show you. Um, the, be, the, the army is behind. I'm going to show you a picture with the army actually uh, plays a role. So, um, the the main idea we have is basically congested clouds. When you have cape, you have instability. You are going to make convection for sure. Uh, that convection, is it going to be deep or not deep? That's the question. The answer we, are, we have is that when you have deep convection, when you have instability, you have cape, you cannot make deep convection if the atmosphere is dry. So you have dry atmosphere, cape, we make congested clouds only. Congested clouds because the, the, the raising parcel will mix with the dry environment. It will lose buoyancy before it reaches the freezing level, where it will get an extra uh, buoyancy from freezing and, and go deep. When these congested clouds are in action for long, they are going to act as a preconditioner for deep convection. They are going to moisten the atmosphere, and the moistening happens into two physical uh, uh, mechanisms at least. There is large-scale convergence because these guys not only are, 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 congest, uh, deep convac are, are making clouds, they also make precipitation. So they are also making large-scale convergence. So by large-scale convergence, they are going to make moisture convergence and they are going to moisten. And also, they detrain. By detraining, they will leave moisture. So that they are going to moisten uh, at least two uh, dynamical, different dynamical processes that lead to moistening. After a moistening episode, you get deep convection. Deep convection lags, lagged by stratiform anvils. And you have this three type cloud picture in a statistical sense, because this is not always true. You can have some deep in front, but lots of congestions. You can have some congestions in the middle, but lots of deep. You can have some stratiform and some deep in the back, but lots of stratiform. So that's how the statistical picture, this is why these various scales can actually be embedded in each other without being uh, completely incoherent or, or incompatible because it's a statistical sense. So that's now the, the army is here. So this is basically the first picture we had uh, when we made the model in 2006. The army of tried uh, cumulus, uh, the, the cumulus, uh, Sorry, cumulus or shallow cumulus in general, which actually don't penet penetrate beyond the trend conversion. Then you have the congested clouds that go beyond, below the freezing level. Then you get deep convection. Then you get stratiform mangroves. And all this is topped by there are lots of uh, environmental flow. There are lots of precipitation and used downdrafts by evaporation of stratiform and so on that make Actually, this is going to, when these guys erode the inversion, they make this cumulus congestus. Cumulus congestus moisten, make deep convection. Deep convection may stratiform. Stratiform creates downdrafts, which rebuilds the trade inversion and rebuilds the cycle, basically. So you have this nice cycle that happens at various scales. At the mesoscale, the synoptic scale, and at the planetary scale. That's the main idea. And the, the, to make a simple model, uh, even simpler, we impose heating profiles. And the heating profiles, there are three of them. There is the deep convection profile that basically heats all the troposphere. And then you have the congestus profile that heats the lower troposphere and cools the upper troposphere. And there is the stratiform profile that just does, does the opposite of the congestus. This is height. This is this is height. This is just pi. Yes. This is pi. It's three point three point five. Three point five. Uh, the, the units are just the units don't mean anything. It's just pi. It's the whole troposphere, sixteen kilometers. 
Yeah, don't, don't, you will be get fooled by the, by the numbers. I'm, I'm in a math department, sorry about that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, the mechanism I was talking about, how can justice lead to deep, and how the two guys interact with each other. I was saying that it's through the moistening. If the atmosphere is moist, it makes deep convection. If it's dry, it makes congestive. So we make up a very simple switch function that takes a small value when the troposphere is moist. It takes large value one when the troposphere is dry. And then it's just linearly interpolated between. Okay? So now you can use like relative humidity as an indicator of moistness or whatever you want as your variable of moistness. And here we are using the difference between the boundary layer TIE and the mid troposphere TIE in a simple model because that's all we have access to. We are not resolving everything so we can have access to the pressure and something like to compute relative humidity. So we are just using this as an indicator. So then you can just make up some nice mathematical equations like this. Deep convection, you have some potential for convection. And then you have this lambda switch function you just put one minus lambda. If this lambda is one, you are not making deep convection, even though you have potential for deep convection. Injustice will have an opposite, basically, uh, formula. You have this lambda minus lambda star. Lambda star is this value. Then if it's, uh, if it's moist, then it's zero. Then you are not making injustice, you are making deep. But if it's dry, this is high, then you are making injustice. And then the Stratiform is just lagging behind deep convection. And then we, basically the simplest model you can make to look at the behavior of these mechanisms, what are they going to give us in terms of waves, in terms of climatology, is to look at the simplest mathematical model that can capture this effect. And the simplest mathematical model that can capture this effect is going to be formed by the two first modes of vertical structure, first and second baroclinic mode. That's basically just a shallow, two shallow water equations that are, have two different uh, gravity wave of propagation. One is 50 meters per second, the other one is 25 meters per second. And they are basically coupled through all this convection uh, I, I was talking about. And of course, you can just make them linear to capture all the waves, and uh, we did that uh, basically uh, on purpose. And then you have a moisture equation. Our moisture equation is just one grid point. We just take the vertical average of the whole troposphere to make an equation for the moisture, and then we have a boundary layer theta E, so that's enough for anything that's above the ocean is enough to have just a theta E equation. But if you want to make it smaller over land, where you have sensible fluxes that are important too. We have a version of this model that also includes uh, dynamics in the boundary layer. These downdrafts, this is the, the green arrows I was shown on the picture that came from stratiform and from the environment. So the downdrafts, basically the moisten and, uh, and the, the, the atmosphere and they dry the boundary layer and cool it. And then we make up some closures, basically. The congestus, we account for congestus as being the measure that we integrate the instability in the lower troposphere, because that's all the congestus care about. And that's, we call it the low-level cape. And we make up some uh, betz miller stuff, uh, sort of parameterization uh, slash cape for deep convection. Uh, yeah, adjust to some uh, background moisture, background temperature, and, and also some cape. And we make up the uh, deep convection. And the downdrafts, as you see, they are proportional to the difference between the theta E and boundary layer and metroposphere. And also there is the effect of the stratiform. And there is, of course, the negative effect from congestus because congestus is pushing up. These guys are pushing down. So you have to have more downdraft when there is less congestus. Now, this is probably most of the audience is familiar with this picture. 
from Wheeler and Kilaris are used as basically a measure to assess climate models, whether they are going to get this picture or not. So this is the first assessment of our model. And basically what we did, we just did linear theory of the model. Linear theory basically just tells you that we are getting instabilities of Kelvin waves, where they should be. We are getting instabilities of east, west, westward inertia gravity waves, where they should be. This is the symmetric part of the spectrum. Uh, there are some catches. Uh, it's, it's a little uh, faster. There are no uh, Rossby waves, but we know exactly why. This, when we make nonlinearities, this is the linear response. When we make the, add the nonlinearity of the switches of convection, this phase speeds, the, 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 the wavelengths actually uh, become longer and we get basically the same exactly scales on the observations. Rossby waves are missing. Rossby waves are captured when we add a barotropic mode. And there is no, uh, uh, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not uh, hard to, to say why, because Rossby waves have a strong bar barotropic component. And when we add a barotropic mode, we capture the Rossby waves. And of course, there is a no, no MJ in the linear, uh, simulation because this is not, uh, it's, MJO is a different animal and we are going to see how we get the MJO when we put a full GCM in, in this model. So this is the, was the anti-symmetric part of the spectrum. We get exactly the same picture. Again, we don't get this westward part. Again, it's because we have done, this is like Rossby waves. We don't have a barotropic mode, but when we add the barotropic mode, a barotropic flow, background barotropic flow, like this, we get Rossby waves in here, we get the MRG waves in here. And, uh, and actually, we, we, de we decommented this, why? Actually, these MRG waves and Rossby waves are not convective instabilities, like the Kelvin waves and the uh, today waves. They are actually shear instabilities. And this is, um, a recent work by George Kilaris and, and Joe Biello, and actually my student also uh, confirmed this in, in different settings. And I would, uh, Sam Stock, he will talk about the effect of vertical shear on these waves. He will talk about CMT, convective momentum transport of these waves on the mean flow. He will talk about multiscale waves in this model synoptic, mesoscale, and planetary scale waves. So this is the, uh, we put now this model, we put it in home. This is home is the new ANCAR model where they are still testing it. Um, it's called this for high uh, order methods um, environment, modeling environment, which um, it's a spectral element code. So we put this multi-cloud model, and of course what we needed for this multi-cloud model, we needed some basis functions to replace this idealized sine functions, the sine functions. And these are psi1 and psi2. And what we are going to get them, we are going to get them from basically just linearizing, uh, linearizing around a basic state. Okay? And we are going to use a basic state that's basically gate, and we are going to use that basic state also for a moisture basic state, because we are using this perturbation moisture to be just the, the, uh, the vertical integral, but of course we are using a basic state for moisture, and this, these functions come out just nicely from solving, um, uh, this is I think a math department, I'm, I'm, I'm actually allowed to say sturm liouville problem, right? And the, the nice term Uber problem is solved by Kasahara and, uh, and Fulton and, and Schubert, I think. And they have this uh, nice code which we can run and then get out this first and second baroclinic modes. These are the, the phi's that give the flow and these are the psi's that give the heating or temperature perturbations if you want. And then we just clip them here at the tropos, at the tropopause uh, and then we get 
The first baroclinic mode looks like a half sign, and then the second baroclinic mode, which looks like a full sign. But of course, they are not exactly the same as the ide idealized sign functions I showed you in the last, in the previous slide. So we put this in, in home, and what? Guess what? We get an MJO on an aqua plant. We get an MJO, and this is just a, one picture of it, and it's in this paper. Uh, I think the year is 2000. On 11, right, it came out, but 2010 is the submission year, I think, but it's in jazz. So you see the 5 meter per second propagation of, of MJO dying and, and, and coming back. We have basically, this is the convection, you see the convection as, as it goes, and you see basically just mesoscale to synoptic scale disturbances inside the MJO that travel in the opposite direction most of the time but sometimes in the same direction. So now I think the, 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 the punchline of my talk is mostly going to be on the stochastic version of the multi-cloud model. So to make a stochastic version of the multi-cloud model, we imagine a lattice, imagine the thick curves is your GCM grid, and then you put a lattice on a fine grid on your GCM grid because, one, you want to capture the subgrid scale variability. Then this lattice is going to be, going to think about each lattice site as being the site at which you either have convection or you don't have convection. Then, if you have convection, which type of convection do you have? We have three types of convection. Congestus, deep, stratiform, or clear. So then we make this, there is a big, a big, uh, theory about um, particle interacting systems in applied math and pure math uh, communities that are known and well studied and so on. And basically we just use this kind of theory. It's also very uh, used in statistical mechanics where it's uh, first started anyways by the Azing model uh, and so on. Um, it's, it's common. It's common. And of course, that's, that's, that's the main thing. If you don't know that, you are doing nothing. That's a very good question. So we set up intuitive transition rules. So a clear sky will turn into a congested site with high probability if you have cape, you have instability, and you have a middle troposphere that's dry. A congested site or a clear site will turn into a deep site if you have high probability, uh, with high probability, if you have high cape and you have middle troposphere is moist. And a deep site will turn into a stratiform with high probability just because of the lagging of stratiform. And of course, all the three cloud types will just naturally decay at some rate, some probability rate. And then you basically made yourself a nice mark of change for those of you who are familiar with probability theory. And that's, it. that's your mark of chain. And this is what's known as particle interaction system and all these fancy words and so on. This is a four-state mark of chain at each state, site, but of course they interact with each other. That makes it a huge system, a huge, huge dimensionality. So the dimensionality is this. This is huge. Don't try to simulate this on your GCF. That's not feasible. What we are going to do, we are going to do coarse greening. Okay? Coarse greening, we are going to get a very cheap birth death process on each GCM grid that's going to represent the interactions of this small scale, under, unresolved scale uh, stochastic process. Uh, yes. Yes. So the only way the, your logic Affected by what's going on in the neighborhood is just by the advection to GCM, am I right? No, 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 it's, it's, well, in this talk I'm going to ignore that because of simplicity, but it's very easy to add. No, no, and I, I can send you a copy. Uh, and yeah, but it's, it, you can do either way. The only catch is that it's going to increase your, the number of parameters. It's going to increase the number of parameters. These are, these are going to induce lots of parameters. Just to keep myself out of trouble, I'm going to assume 
that all the interactions through the clouds happen through the large scales. So the large scales impose the rates, but that's not, that's not a shortcoming at all. Uh, that, that's not, it doesn't inhibit the way you, you, you uh, basically, this is, as I said, it's a Markov chain, the configuration wait an exponential time before it makes a transition at a, at a given site. And then, of course, this is just basically the way to write the math down. If you are curious, uh, you can go read the papers. Uh, it's, it's probably boring to, for me to go into the details like this for uh, uh, a multidimensional uh, disciplinary audience like this. But basically, we write down this carefully, mathematically, and very nicely if you go read the papers. And, of course, we have some time scales that we impose, and these are basically just parameters. And just recently, we are developing a new methodology, statistical methodology, that's going to take care of these parameters, give me data, I'm going to uh, infer these parameters from data, and we are going to use such methods, actually, to infer these kind of parameters, and also other parameters that are the uh, local interactions as well. And here I'm just going to give some intuitive values for these parameters to do some uh, demonstrations, basically. So, as I said, so one local interactions, it's really easy to see, basically, this is, there is, uh, what's the nice thing about this model is that you can write down a climatology of your area fractions. You can, if you just think about the large scale climate being imposing the configuration of the small scales, you can write down exactly the equilibrium measure. You can write down the area fractions, what they are. So give me data. I can, I can measure the area fractions from data. I can then match this data to these climatological area fractions, and then I can come out with parameters of the model that give me the exact climate, and then I can use it in the dynamics. And this is the strategy we are using, actually, in a new paper with, um, with Peter, uh, Peters and Christian Jacob and Andy and myself and other collaborators in a model where we are testing this stochastic model to data. So, as I said, basically what you have, you, if you sum all the indicator functions on each GCM grid of this small scale parameter, you get the number of population of cloud types. This is just for congestus. And then if you want to get the area fraction of congestus, just divide the population of congestus by the total number of sites in that GCM grid. You can do it for everything. And it's not, it's not, it's a very simple probability theory exercise to figure out that the expected value of the sigma C is exactly that equilibrium climate uh, value I was talking. So this is all consistent mathematically and physically designed. So this is just an evolution of this model in uh, a very frozen climate, basically. And that's the climatological values I'm given. And I start from somewhere, anywhere. Quickly, the model converts these climatological values and varies there. You are capturing the variability. But, of course, you are keeping the mean that you wanted. Okay? This is very important. And this is basically just some configuration that you will have. As you see it, it's mostly like a kind of random because, of course, uh, this, this model in yours, the local interaction. But when you add the local interactions, you can get clustering inside the, 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 the thing. You, get, you can get clustering. So you can get mesoscale systems that are not resolved on your GCM grid you can actually capture them with stochastic model. Yes? This is the strata form. This is, this is the average over the grid box. This is a GCM grid box. Yes. This counting all the grid boxes here inside. In observations, normally strata form is larger than the convective area. Oh, that's a good point. That's so a very good point. This? this is just a demonstration. If you know, this is not realistic. I'm a mathematician again, okay? <laughs> I just, I just showing this 
because if I put real values, what's going to happen is that all these curves will underlie on, on top of each other. It will be hard, very hard to convince at least people who are not familiar with the subject that this is doing something what I want to do. And actually, I teach a lot of undergrad students, and I like, I like academic examples. This is an academic example. Okay? This, it's a very good point. I appreciate that. And so the, uh, I, I, I said about the coarse graining, basically you get this nice, uh, oh, this, is, this is bad, I'm, I'm recycling a slide from an old talk, so this isn't relevant. So, um, so I, was, I was saying the, 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 you, get, you get these three cloud populations, you get their probabilities nicely, and basically all you need to evolve is these three populations on each grid GCM. You don't need to worry about this high dimensional uh, model anymore after you do the core screen. Now, how do you couple it to GCM? Well, we just couple it to this uh, simple model I described before by adding this area fraction I was talking about in front of the congestus and deep in replacement of the switch function the deterministic switch function, now it's, it's a stochastic switch function. The stochastic model is telling me how much congestus I have and how much deep I have inside the grid. Okay? And it tells me how much static form and so on. So today I'm going to show you some simulations with two different closures of the static form heating. A diagnostic closure which is basically just done here in the, uh, hoping that the stochastic model is enough to get the, the delay of stratiform or the lag stratiform. And this one incorporates the lag stratiform just like in the deterministic multi-cloud model. This is like more consistent with the deterministic model. And we are going to see what's going to happen if you use just this or this. So this is just one, the first experiment we did with this model, and we are very, very, we are very excited when we saw this. This is a numerical simulation by uh, Wojtek, and it's R, 2000, is this right, Wojtek? And this is probably just uh, 4,000 kilometers, but this is 40,000 kilometers, with a warm pool uh, background. So time goes down, we get the quality metric, is excellent. We are getting basically exactly the same kind of behavior you see in the Sierra. On top of that, we are getting actually some convection outside the warm pool, which is more intermittent and more sporadic. We are getting these waves, and very nice. Yeah. So, so the, 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 I was talking about the congestus moistening. I told you that the, we believe this is the main driver of the deepening of convection. That's may, what makes transition from shallow to deep is this whole congestus mode that makes this transition from shallow to deep. And it does it from large scale, low level moisture convergence because of the low level heating. And this is actually the main idea when we came up with the model in 2006, and we tested it there. We tested it when we removed the large-scale convergence in the model due to congestive heating, namely from the second baroclinic mode, the instability of Kelvin waves or, or gravity waves that look like Kelvin waves disappeared. It's very important. It's the main mechanism. There is also another mechanism which we doc documented in this paper with uh, Mike Lloyd. The detrainment of non-precipitating injustice clouds can make up the transition from shallow to deep. So today I'm going to add this in this model. Before it didn't have it, it has only the large scale. So and then I'm going to compare this diagnostic and pronostic study form closure and see how if we can leak 
the stochastic and the deterministic model. So the, the congestus detrainment, we just add some, uh, basically just some, some, uh, some, 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 some factor here, which we call EC, that's just from evaporation of congestus, that's proportional to congestus, and the difference between theta E in the boundary layer and in the lower layer layer, in the lower layer of the troposphere. That's what we call it EN. And the, basically then we just add that as a moistening effect and of course as a drying effect in the boundary layer. The deterministic mean field equations we can write down nice deterministic field equations from the birth death process. You have rates then you can write ODEs instead of this probabilistic uh, model. You can write a deterministic model. Let's call them mean, mean field equations. And if you write the deterministic model you can actually easily link this uh, area fractions to the switch function easily. And we did it here. It's basically the same mechanism. So the two ideas we put in the deterministic and the stochastic model are basically the same idea. It's just a different mathematical model. So this is the first uh, single column simulations we did with the multicolor model. This is in a deterministic setting. Uh, this is uh, the stochastic setting without the, this is the, the, uh, the closure, that's a uh, diagnostic closure of starry form, and this is the pronostic closure. And the only, the main difference is just that what we get is the heating, the starry form heating is uh, nicely lagging deep convection. So you get always the congestus peaks and then Sometimes can just picks without anything, and then but then later on it picks, then it, it's followed by deep and then starting point, and then you get a congestus event, and nothing happens. A second congestus event follows by deep convection. You get all these kind of chaotic stochastic dynamics that you cannot get in a deterministic model that's tied to the to the large scale dynamics. Yes. Oh, closure is. This uh, equation that you write down for your heating. How do you define your heating from the large scale variables? How you define the heating? That's the closure. So, um, so these are, this is a closure. I call it a diagnostic closure for stratiform. And this is a, another closure for stratiform. I call it a prognostic closure. This is a closure. This is a closure. These are all closures. No, it's a physical closure. It's not a mathematical closure. It's not anything like mathematically derived closure. It's based on physical intuition. And stability gives heating. Moisture gives heating. And things like that. Yeah, the link, the link between the two, that's mathematical. That's yeah. mathematical. Yeah. Yeah, there is lots of math, there is lots of physics here. It's, it's confusing. I agree. So this is the congestus detrainment regime. When you go to the congestus detrainment regime, you get these congestus events become even more important. Like here, with just 10, 10, uh, small lattice sites is just 10 by 10 and this is 30 by 30 and you get this congestus prolonged congestus events before you start making deep convection. So this is uh, more like when you go to, to higher resolution. It's, it's kind of uh, very uh, intriguing how this uh, congestus detrainment makes even like this dry episodes that we didn't see before uh, in, in, in the model. So uh, this is basically just a um, curiosity kind of thing. When we, 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 we compare the deterministic mean field closures with the stochastic closures, you still get some chaotic behavior even with this deterministic model, deterministic closure, the ODEs. Uh, but of course, you are losing all the stochasticity but you are, you are getting 
you are getting some like chaotic, chaotic deterministic chaos, which is almost kind of regular. The, the strength is, is kind, of, kind of expected. In the stochastic behavior, you have this uh, intermittency that you, you, you lose when you go to the, to the deterministic uh, kind of thing. So it's kind of, although it's kind of chaotic, but it's, it's not as, as uh, uh, interesting as the stochastic model. So when we do uh, nonlinear simulations, so this is basically when we don't have this is the stochastic model with, uh, with the diagnostic closure, we get this kind of waves that move. This is just a U1, a U2. This is theta1 and theta2. When we go to the prognostic, you get, you can see kind of some kind of some envelopes of convection. They, they go, this is just the, the wind. I'm going to show you the, the other variables. It's more, it's more, uh, but, but the important thing is that what you see here, there are lots of dry waves also in the, in, in the middle between the, the moist waves that are, that are very prominent. Uh, so this is the, the stochastic, um, uh, the, the other closure, the lack pronostic stratum closure, the convective variables. This is theta EB, Q, this is the area fraction, and just as deep stratiform. This is the heating. You get these waves going in that direction, but inside the way you get all this, all these mesoscale structures that are popping out in, in, in different directions, but you get this nice synoptic scale waves that go in both directions, and it's very chaotic, in, in, like you see them. When I increase the number of sites, it becomes more deterministic in some sense because what happens if you increase the number of sites, you are going to deterministic limit. It's expected. So you get these envelopes that are kind of very persistent. They don't really, in the previous one, they die quickly as they encounter each other. They are, here they are very persistent. They basically just go and, and you still have this behavior, the synoptic scale, or the mesoscale behavior inside the synoptic scale. So this is kind of a regime of forced convection. It, it, it is like a more deterministic rather than the enforced convection with the, the small scales are, are the, the unresolved scales of convection are more important. So it's more stochastic. Do you understand why only one type of waves is there? Or yes, well, I will have a theory. It's, I'm going to show you some slides. We have a theory. So, so the idea is, is that these waves, as you see, there are lots of dry waves coming out from here, dry gravity waves that are moving at 50 meters per second. And this is, uh, there is the work of, of Sam and Andy and Brian Mapes and uh, lots of people, uh, maybe not lots, only these two groups, why I'm saying lots, who showed basically systematically that this kind of waves shot convection. So basically what these waves are doing, they are shutting anything in, in the subsiding regions of these dominant waves. So then they become very prominent. So, the, the, and so they become, it becomes, also it's, it's, it's more kind of locked. So when we add the, the detriment uh, mechanism, it becomes more apparent. So you see the wave here, you see the dry waves coming out in both directions. You see here, this is the, the, the heating. You see there's lots of convection that tries to make it. But it can't make it because the dry waves that come out of here are just killing it. So, yeah, yeah, because they are equally strong. The other one was just one direction, right? Yeah, but this one is kind of one direction too. So you see this one? This one is kind of one direction too. So there are these persistent waves. And uh, of course, this is just our theory. We have basically to check it, uh, of course, with, with, with more sophisticated tools. Um, so this is the climatology uh, of adding a warm pool. So if you just use a deterministic model, uh, on purpose, we are using a very, very bad parameter regime for the deterministic model. You get this kind of peak in the congestus. This is kind of. Near, nothing near uh, a nice warm pool system. When you run the stochastic model in the same parameter regime, you get this nice 
nice Walker circulation. Uh, this is the heating only. I'm going to show the Walker circulation. And you see, this is the end of a triple peak in precipitation. It's seen in both the stochastic, the diagnostic, and the prognostic closures. It's also seen in, in, in recent numerical simulations, CRM simulations, uh, Andy with, uh, with his postdocs and Olivier also with, with, with uh, Andy and Olivier with their postdocs. So, and this is the Walker circulation you see. It's in, in this uh, very nice uh, Walker circulation. And now the waves again. You see the waves inside. They are like kind of, this is kind of some kind of organization. They are shutting other waves in, inside. So that these are three different regimes, but they are kind of this, this behavior is, is very, very persisting. So, um, so I'm going to show you some statistics. I think I have only one minute left. Uh, so the area fraction, the, when we do the stochastic deterministic, the variability is very weak in the model. When you go to the stochastic, you increase the variability by like almost like five times or more. So it's, it's really um, persistent. So we did some correlation, lack correlation times. This is what you get with the deterministic, with the stochastic model with, without the stratiform lag. When we add the stratiform, this is water vapor, this is uh, deep convection. Deep convection is short-lived. Lived. This is like what people saw in, in observations, David Neal in his group. But water vapor is, is long-lived and has very long uh, time lag correlation. When we add the stratiform lag, we see lots of uh, improvement in the, in the water vapor uh, correlation. We did the frequency of occurrence of precipitation events. We got this nice kind of power lapse. GCMs usually you just go like this. We don't, they don't get these rare events, the extreme events. When we add the congestive detrainment, it's become less steep even. So that's, so I'm done. So this, I'm just have the conclusion slide. Um, I, I have to stop here since I'm running out of time. I have one question. Well, um, how, how does your uh, stochastic model behave when the, the parent model is, is higher resolution? You know, well, how, how, well, you know, if you go to higher resolution GCMs, uh -huh. how, how does this behave? Is there any, you know, um, scale awareness of the problem? Of the well, well, there is a scale of awareness. So basically you have your lattice sites, they, they represent some scale. Right. Right? You have your... You have your scale of variability of, of your convection. So if you have a big grid GCM, so you are going to use many, many sites. So you basically are going to be close to the deterministic uh -huh. limit. If you are in an intermediate grid, you are going to use this kind of uh, things we are using, like 20 or 30 by 30. Well, but what if you are going to very, very short, hmm. then you are going to use less. Then, then it's going to be more, more even more stochastic. Then if you go too much smaller, then basically you are that's at the, the resolution. That's the question I'm asking, yeah. really. I mean, a, a, a climate model, say, with a 25-kilometer grid, Yeah. what difference would that be? A 35-kilometer grid, if you think of your convection, it's on 5 to 10 kilometers. So 35 kilometers, it's going to be 7 by 7 grid point. So yeah, but the like stratiform region will be much bigger. No, no, these are sites. So this is not a cloud. This is a, a site, it's a, con a convectant site. So if you have, if your large scale is telling you to make stratiform on all these grid points, then it's going to make stratiform at all these grid points. So if I can, if I can ask the question after Andy stops explaining, sorry Andy, <laughs> to me. <it's laughs> We cannot have two discussions at the same time. Oh. <laughs> okay. But I will ask my question anyway. So, you know, from the, from the physical point of view, if I think about shallow convection, deep convection, the picture I have in mind 
is that shallow convection cumuli, not stratocumuli, yeah. uh -huh. are clouds which are s small in size. Yeah. In other words, they are, they are, their weight is determined by the size of Mandarelaya eddies. They yeah. are basically sitting yeah. on top of those eddies yeah. and grow a little bit. Yeah. Well, they are narrow, which means they entrain a lot. Yeah. And that's why they cannot get very deep. So you, they entrain dry air that kills buoyancy. This so is not so shallow. This is congestus. Well, but it congestus is kind of... No, no, okay. You see, okay. well, let me... Uh, I, uh, but, well, check, I think you missed the point. No, the no, 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 but let, let, let no, me... I think you missed the point. Just, just hold the side. No, Bulam, I know hold what you... I, I, I'm I, not talking about the shallow. The shallow no, is in the background. Yeah, but you see, congestus. You see, my, my my point is that that the transition, the important part in the transition from shallow to deep through the congestus phase, is a little bit of precipitation. Because once you get a little bit of precipitation, then you start getting downdraft. That's the congestus. Yes, that's uh, what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, so you're basically saying that then you go to the congestus regime. When you go to the congestus regime, you start moistening. The, the upper troposphere. The, the shallow cumulus is moistening below the trade wind. That, that inversion. That's not relevant to deep convection. Okay. So maybe they are bad, bad. They are eroding the inversion. But maybe I'm That's thinking. Important. Maybe I'm thinking too much in terms should, of shallow to deep well, of the should, land, which should, is very fast and. Okay. okay. Yeah, you should um, look. So. In your moisture equation, way in the beginning, you had a vertically integrated, vertically integrated moisture. Yes. Um, and thereafter, when you use Q, it's vertically integrated, right? Yes, yes. And so you don't have the freedom to distinguish dry aloft and moist below. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah, so you the, do the, that determination. The, the vertically integrated. Yeah. is the perturbation from a background. That's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, it's the, yeah. the perturbation from a background. Yeah. No, okay. I know. The perturbation is the one... Uh, but the, the, the vertically integrated moisture is a bottom-heavy function. It's an exponential. So it's the basis function on which we um, projected the moisture before doing the vertical integration has a bottom-heavy. So when it's moist, it's moist in the bottom of the troposphere, in the lower, the lower grid points if you want. But the, the feeling is it's not, you are not going to gain much. And this is enough. This is our, our point. So we are trying to make the simplest possible mathematical model to explain this phenomenon. And one grid point for moisture is enough. So in the, in the life history of a, a cloud system, Mission yes. scale cloud system. How do these things change? You know, your uh, portioning the various things from the early development stage to the peak development stage of the Mission scale system. How do they vary in numbers? How, what what amount of the area of the disturbance is occupied by different configurations? So, um, so the model behavior. So the model is run to statistical equilibrium. Okay, once you start forming these waves, they are basically going forever. They come and go, they come and go. They make their own climate and they evolve in them. So this is idealized simulations. It's not like a real world. It's like an aqua planet simulation. So my question. So in the model, at the beginning you prescribe uh, two Cs, 25 and 50 meter per second, right? Yes. So. And is there a later on feedback from the moist waves changing this C, or this is just constant in the model? This is the background. This okay. Is, and this is the background, and these are the documented modes on which tropical waves project the moisture. Yeah, and there is no any effect of the moisture on the on the change of the. Okay. Okay. So these I'm, I'm just I'm just checking. Of variability <laughs> okay. of tropical waves. So. So how is well, this? There is one thing that's missing in a barotropic mode, but that's true. Mm. But it's not relevant for equatorial Kelvin waves and things like that. No, I it's just wonder. I just wonder whether these prescribed dry, whether these prescribed C1, C2 are related to what you call 
gravity drive, gravity waves shutting up convection. Or whether they question. are related. Well, there are these waves they are in the system, of course. Okay. And, and the second. And these are also the waves, the dry waves okay. that are observed at the, at the same time. And if the you talk to people like George Kilaris, he, he, will, he will tell you like dry waves are first baroclinic waves. And the second question is the, how the, are the energy spectra changed when you add these stochastic uh, parametrizations? Do you, see, uh, um, do you see the change of the energy spectra to minus five thirds? Or what is, what are the, what's, the, what's the change minus of the energy spectra? This is not a turbulent spectrum I'm showing. What I showed is the precipitation, the occurrence of precipitation events. Yeah, but when you just draw the spectrum this of... This is a the stochastic kinetic. model. Yes. And the deterministic model cannot capture well the tails. May, may I speak? Okay, I wanted to say, you're, you've confused the mid-latitude stochastic backscatter of kin kinetic energy. This is the tropical variability we're talking about. No, I, I just told you her that. Andrew. I didn't think so. Yeah, you didn't think so. The, oh. the, I mean, uh, let's make a vote. Did they tell her? <laughs> okay, she's convinced. Yes, yes, but, but uh, then the in the vertical structure functions for the moisture? Uh, the, was it derived from the data or from the analytical? Well, uh, good question. When you said. Because the background, that, yeah. the background okay. is data. Okay. The perturbation varies. It's a dynamical uh, variant. Okay. okay, this is the what I, we can talk that's later the perturbation, yeah. that's yeah. the yeah. average. Yeah. I, the okay, vertical. so there was no rigid top assumption then. For moisture? No, for the... Last time yeah, I checked in the tropopos, there was no moisture. It was very little. No, I wonder about the, the derived analytical... So there is a rigid top, right? There is a rigid, rigid there top, is a rigid right. top yeah. for moisture, yes. Uh, how do you choose the convective or shallow or... Uh, I mean, these time scales or radiation time scale? And how will, will they match with uh, uh, your uh, stochastic model? They, they are talking about the time scale the transition. Yes. Tau C so, or tau what, what I showed here, the, the, all the simulations, we took the time scale by just brainstorming, right? looking at data, talking to people, how long it takes for a congestus to die, how long it takes for to fall, and we use this as basically guidelines to, to pick values. But we are, we, are, we are building a strategy, a st statistical strategy, Bayesian and Ferns of parameters which we can actually compute these parameters from data. And we are, the project is ongoing. And how well does that match with uh, your stochastic model? Very good question. We did this for data already, but a different way, by just matching the equilibrium I was talking. And this is what uh, uh, Peters, Christian Peters did uh, for Darwin data. What he found out, most of the parameters he found are very close to what the one we picked. And actually, it was, we didn't really do it. We didn't think we did it right, actually. But it was just a surprise to see that they were very close, except for the congestus, actually. Uh, birth of congestus was actually much faster than what we thought. We thought it's uh, one hour. We found it's half hour, oh, except for that. We are, we are in the bull. What's that? We don't know. We, for us. For, for us, we just take basically, you know, academic examples. Let's try this. That's it. We, of course, we look at data carefully to see which one to pick. We, we don't want to pick one day while convective clouds uh, scale are ours. That we didn't do that. But to say that we are precisely exact, no, we are not. Okay, thanks very much, Quinta, You're welcome. Uh, for all the discussion. Let's thank him. I now request uh, Steckman to come and give his talk. <laughs>